In this video, I'm gonna take a look at some of the mixing possibilities in Adobe Premiere. So uh, with a lot of projects, I might complete the entire project within Adobe Premiere rather than sending it to a professional sound mixer who may use something like Pro Tools to mix the film. If I'm on a short timeline for a uh, project, I might also do most of the work in Premiere and then send it over to a mixer. So uh, it all depends on how much uh, preparation you need to do in post-production for that project. Uh, the project we're looking at right here is a short narrative film, and it has a number of tracks. Um, I have labeled some of them uh, at least, so I know that this is the boom channel, this is a love channel, this is a love channel, there's another boom channel, where things may have overlapped between the dialogue. So pretty much the first six tracks here are all dialogue based. Um, I get down here and I have some pieces of music that are either coming in early in the film, playing in the bar scene, uh, or we have some other little cues here that are, I think are sound effects that are brought in. Um, they didn't really fit in the dialogue tracks. I wanted to keep the dialogue completely separate from um, any sound effects or music and then music comes in here at the end so we can see that and if I scroll down a little bit you can see that I actually have a whole bunch of other small sound effects going on right here so there's a there's a sequence in the film that uses a whole bunch of sound effects in a very short amount of time so to build up that soundscape for those couple of seconds here, we needed a lot of tracks. So I think I'm up to, what, 25 tracks here for that particular moment. So the first step really in any sound mixing um, preparation would be to organize your tracks. So as you see here, I've organized my dialogue tracks and my sound effects to some extent and my music. Um, I believe this is some ambience right here. Um, there's not a lot of other ambient tracks in here. I think this could, you know, really benefit from an overall sound design for the film, um, which I believe the sound mixer did in this case for this film. This is the uh, edit right before it gets sent off to the mix. But I'm going to still walk us through some of the um, possibilities that we have in terms of audio mixing within Premiere. Um, so I would, if I had any... Uh, audio issues with dialogue being too low. So for example, I don't know that I have anything in this sequence here. Hi, Mike. Christina. So one of the things that I could do if my levels aren't very good there. So um, let me take a look here. Uh, as we play through that clip. You're way hotter person. So my levels are hitting uh, 12 on the um, on the meter here, minus 12. So that's not too bad for some dialogue. If I had stuff that needed to be uh, louder. Do you think so? I might be able to normalize that. So if I had something that was really quiet, I could select the track. If I right click on that, or control click, and I can go to the audio gain panel, and that's gonna allow me to open this up. In this win pop-up window that happens here, uh, I can adjust the gain using normalize, which is gonna, it's gonna analyze the clip uh, in this sequence, and it's gonna say, hey, the, the, you know, the loudest part of that sound is minus 3.8. So if we choose to normalize, it's gonna take that loudest sound and bring it up to zero, and everything is going to go up in value to that same amount. Not up to zero, but to actually everything is raised relative to that. Now, if I wanted to simply set a gain to a certain amount, meaning I just want to raise it up by six decibels, and I don't care if this you know highest peak then gets clipped, that would be, uh, well, that'd be kind of crazy, I think. But uh, So we don't need to normalize this because it has a, a good amount of volume or amplitude right now. So I'm, I'm happy with that. But if I did have audio that was recorded sort of weak, I could... Uh, boost the gain on that. Now boosting the gain, uh, I get a lot more control over that piece of audio than just the 15 decibels that are available here in my uh, in my timeline. 
Now, if I am doing a proper mix, uh, I'm probably mixing the track because the at that point, the picture has been locked and the soundtrack is locked. So I'm not um, still adjusting these necessarily clip by clip. You see, I have some adjustments here, maybe in this small moment, whatever that is. Um, maybe there's a little boost of something right there that I had for the temp mix, at least the mix that I was working on right here. Um, but in general, I'm probably going to be mixing on a track basis. Now, uh, we may have looked at in earlier classes, we may have looked at uh, keyframing uh, on a clip basis, and we've also looked at panning. Now, Premiere has hidden that away because it's a video editing application. At least that's what I believe. And so they hide away stuff that is related to audio in really small places like the diamond here on the uh, left side of the track. I can go from clip keyframes to track keyframes and track panner. So we may have taken a look at the track panner. If I have I want to do some sound design and push one particular part of a piece of dialogue or a sound effect or something else to one side or the other. Now track keyframes, this is where we can get into trouble as you may have, uh, I've gotten into trouble in the past where um, I'm trying to make some adjustments to not the volume of the track. Undo that, there we go. Uh, but if I'm trying to do something like select the clip, it won't actually let me because the track panner is on or the track volume is on because the track volume is on. So I can't make any adjustments to that. Again, it's sort of like this is picture lock, so I shouldn't be messing around with that. But if I want to make adjustments now that the picture is locked and I want to make adjustments to the overall volume of a particular track as a track, this would be the visual form of that. Now I'm going to take you over to the audio mixer and we're going to take a look at um, some other options there. I'm going to switch that back to keyframes just for a moment. There we go. And then uh, as I'm finishing up my sound editing, a lot of times I'll use the solo or mute. Um, if I want to hear and work on dialogue, I might mute the music tracks um, for a particular scene so that I'm not actually listening to that. Because in, in a lot of times, um, the music that I put over the scene is more of a finishing touch and it's kind of, um, it, it might be masking some of the other um, sounds in the dialogue that I'm trying to work on in terms of editing. So I want to make sure everything's clean um, as far as that goes before sending it off to mix with the music and such. Okay, um, great. So I might have volume adjusted things um, in this window and now I'm going to head over to audio. So when I click on the audio uh, button up at the top, um, I still get a uh, project window over here. And now I have a audio track mixer and I have source clips and effects and all of that stuff. I have a tiny little window here of the film and I have some sound effects, some you know corporate uplifting music that I could possibly drop in. Not sure what that is, but um, I don't think we want it in our film. Um, so if I want to get some more real estate, I'm just going to kind of move this over here. I could probably close that panel altogether. There we go. Um, and my volume graph doesn't need to be quite that big. If I am working on sound editing and I want to work with some of the clips and I need more real estate, don't forget to highlight the window that you're working in and press the tilde key, which is right below the escape key. And that'll make my tracks the whole entire size. And if I use the bracket or uh, backspace key right below delete, um, that will actually allow me to uh, fit the entire film's worth of clips into my screen space. All right, so now I'm back here. And as I play the film, this clip mixer, which is built in, is going to play those sound effects. It's crazy. We just met. And it's going to play all of those. And you see we have more and more tracks here, right? So all of my tracks are represented because of that sound effects, those sound effects cues that I have. But in general, these are most of the tracks that I'm using, except for those 
two moments. Now I have two different mixers here. So an audio clip mixer and an audio track mixer. So the track mixer is for uh, the entire track as we were, as I was just mentioning before. And the clip mixer is the oh, individual you know volumes. Psycho. I'm willing to take that chance. Let's so the volume settings for each one of those individual clips is set right there. Um, and I'm not using that for the most part when I move over to audio mixing. Any work that I've done as a clip um, is, is pretty much done in the interface in the timeline most likely, but it is represented up here in the audio clip mixer. Okay, uh, so my audio track mixer. Uh, one of the things that is pretty cool uh, and possible within Premiere that is something that we usually think of a digital audio workstation like Pro Tools uh, is that I can do some sort of automation with this. So depending on how things, I'm gonna pull it back to this piece of music here. There we go. And uh, it looks like this is on channel three. So channel three has this piece of music, I think. Nope, looks like it's over here. Uh, channels music eight and seven um, and so if for example I'm going to set this to right all right so I'm gonna listen to that particular piece of music uh, and I'm just gonna mute the other the other side of that piece of music even though in Premiere uh, unless I push a particular track to the left or to the right, it's gonna play equally out of both channels. So if you have a piece of music that has very distinct left, right um, stereo spacing, either bring that piece of stereo music in and in a single track space or uh, make sure and uh, pan those to the left and right. Otherwise they will play equally out. All right, so um, I don't want to I want to set that one to read and I'm gonna set this one to write there we go okay so once I've set that track to write and I begin playing that track now I have live control over this mixer as we play the film So I'm controlling this fader with the mouse and bringing it up as the scene builds. And I'm gonna let go and press spacebar. So what happened with that particular moment, let me scroll down here in the timeline. There we go. All right. And if I open this up a little bit here, click on the diamond and let's take a look at track keyframes. So all of these keyframes right here are what I just did with the slider. So through automation, I created this particular moment right here. So if I back up to the beginning of the living room scene here, and I decide, well, I didn't do a very good job of that. After I complete the automation with read, it automatically switches to touch. And so what this means is it's only gonna record new keyframes if I touch the fader, if I leave my hands off or mouse off of this fader, um, it's gonna revert back to whatever these keyframes are. So as I space bar, and I'm gonna hold up this a little bit hot longer. So I'm gonna, So after I did that, uh, it let the music have its own fade and then dropped it down rather suddenly. I still don't like that. So I'm gonna back this up and we're gonna try one more time. All right. And there we go. So that may be a little bit uh, gentler, kinder, I'm not quite sure. Um, the other options here um, besides, oops, I'm in the wrong one. There we go. Uh, right, uh, touch, latch, and then finally read. Read is the normal setting. So this is um, 
where all of them should be once I've completed that task. So it's going to read whatever keyframes are there. All right. So I wouldn't necessarily have to do the right. I could do touch and finesse in different moments of my music. You can see here that I already had a bit of work done on this piece of music here as a clip. So I didn't actually need to do that fade out the way I did um, with automation. So I'm going to unmute that right now. And uh, I don't know why I had solo turned on there. All right, so that was that sequence right there. Um, the next step I'd like to take us through here in the audio track mixer would be to apply effects. But first, I need to uh, come down to my track here. I'm going to go to full screen. And I'm going to add a track or tracks. And uh, it's not a video track I need. It's not even a audio track, but rather a submix track. So I want one submix track. It's going to be stereo. And where do I want it to be? Um, it says before first track. So I guess we'll see where that where that lands. Um, it looks like it's all the way down here. Submix track. So. A submix track is not something where I can actually place a clip into, but rather is used for patching my audio. So let's say that I want all of my dialogue. Where is my dialogue? Here it is. Um, so at some instances, I have three channels of dialogue here and three channels of dialogue here, and I would like to have all of that audio go through some sort of processing. Uh, it might be an equalization. I might want to have all of the audio from the whole movie, the dialogue from the whole movie, go through some type of EQ to make it sound a little bit better. Uh, maybe I need to have certain tracks, like the lav tracks, perhaps should all go to some sort of equalization. And I could label that. So if I scroll across here in my mixer, I can also, it's called Submix 1 by default, but maybe I could call it Submix Dialog. It's going to put a DIA on there. Great. Um, and then as I scroll across here, um, oops. So up here in the clip mixer, um, where the audio is coming from is it's in the track. So that's why these are grayed out here. But if I want one to head over to submix DIA, I could have all of my audio that is a dialogue. There we go. So law of four. So that's all the dialogue tracks. They're first going to go over to the submix channel. And then after the submix channel, they go to the final mix. And the final mix is my output. That's what gets spit out to the QuickTime movie that I make. That's what plays out the speakers or headphones when you're listening to the film. So first, it has to go through each one of these channels. Uh, and then I'm going to send it over to submix for further processing, at which point it sends out to the mix. Now I could have my sound effects go to yet another submix. I could have the submix go to a submix. Let's try that. So if I add a new track, um, let's add a track. Oops, I didn't want to add that kind of track. I want to add tracks. And I want another submix track. One, it's another stereo. And we're going to say zero zero and okay all right and so this is submix two and instead of um, going out the mix the submix dialogue is then going to go to submix two and all of our other channels here i'm going to set to oops i didn't want to do that Now in a full-blown mix, the audio mixer would separate out the dialogue, the music, and the sound effects into three different stems. 
And those stems are important because the film itself, uh, since the early days of, of Hollywood, as soon as we realized that uh, it was a... Oh, and that's already going to submix there. Um, as soon as we realized that we need to replace dialogue with other languages, having the sound effects stripped out of it created a whole industry of audio recording and sound effects creation um, based on the idea that we need to recreate all the sound effects that were recorded at the time of filming. So the dialogue gets mixed into a separate piece and the music is mixed into a separate piece and it's only that final stage where it's mixed for distribution in whatever market where all of those are brought together. So this idea of having a submix of dialogue that gets put into the final mix is not um, irregular. Uh, the way I'm doing it might be, I'm, again, this is a, a short narrative film, and I'm not too concerned about the sound effects and music being all crunched together, um, because it's unlikely that I'm going to do a dub of this into another language. So, uh, but in this case, I would like to have perhaps some processing or some noise reduction or some other things applied to that dialogue. Adobe Premiere hides things from you and so um, there may be another menu pull down here that I'm not aware of but if I click on this um, arrow right next to the built-in it says show hide effects and sends so this is exactly what we need right now um, and so this category right here these are all slots for me to find my sound effects so um, let's start with something right here. It doesn't really matter which one, but remember, um, well, maybe not remember, but uh, know that uh, if a sound first travels through an effect and then it goes to the next effect and then it goes to next, the next effect and so on. So um, these are in order depending on how you would like them to be processed. So a sound that has been equalized and then applied with a reverb that may sound different than a sound effect that is first has a reverb applied and then an equalization applied. So depending on which order you want to apply them, they may sound different. Okay, so I'm going to click and pull down and I have a list of filters much like the ones that I would find in Adobe Audition. Uh, amplitude and compression. So this is where I might find a compressor. So if I'm trying to clean up some sounds um, and make them sound um, in a particular way or reduce some high frequency annoyances, um, I could play around with that. Um, the delay and echo, if I wanted something um, interesting. Um, we've got some more equalizations, a graphic equalizer, a high pass and a low pass uh, filter, and those are adjustable as well, and a simple parametric equalizer. Some modulation, some noise reduction, so um, the denoise and dereverb um, plugins here I think are brought over from Adobe's Audition program. Denoise um, does a very good job, but it can also be a very dangerous filter, um, making sounds and voices, especially music too, um, sound very mechanical, robotic, and, and almost digital. So be very careful with denoise. Uh, reverb um, to add space to sounds, things that were recorded in a in a VO booth might help from that. We've got some special vocal enhancers um, and time shifting and pitch shifting there. So that might be interesting. There's also some Apple plugins that are available. Um, so if I pull open a uh, multiband compressor, or let's try a little bit of, let's try a little bit of denoise and see what happens here. So right now it's set to 40% by default. And if I solo my dialogue tracks so that we don't, oops, I don't want to solo those. So I'm going to solo my dialogue tracks as they head over to that submix so that I can listen to some sounds without the 
music coming in. So I wanna play around with this denoise filter. I'm gonna double click on denoise right there. And there's a default, there's heavy noise reduction, there's light noise reduction. So depending on what we think is going to be needed for this, by default, it looks like it's applying 40% across the board, all frequencies. I have some preset options here. If I'm gonna focus on lower and higher frequencies, if I'm gonna focus on lower and higher frequencies, uh, focus just on the high frequencies. So as I begin to play the sound, Another beer? Uh, yes, please. I'm famished. So it's sounding very mechanical. There's something um, a little bit uh, industrial about that. So let's try the lighter compression. That drops it down to 20%. And we'll take a listen to that same. Another beer? Uh, yes, please. So perhaps it's not needed very much in this sequence. It seems to be attacking some of our actual sound. So uh, if I wanna hear what that sounds like without any noise reduction. Another beer? Uh, yes, please. I'm there's some HVAC sounds and some other things that are moving through there. And so that light bit of noise reduction might help. And perhaps we work on the lows and the highs to cut those. I believe that was the preset. Focus on lower and high frequencies. Focus on mid frequencies. So if we focus on this and maybe bump that back up to 15% and move through here, maybe it'll leave our voices alone a little bit. Another beer? Uh, yes, please. I'm famished. All right, that seems pretty nice. Um, obviously, we'd want to take a listen in a few other spots. Let's get out of here. All right, so once I click and close that, it's still applied. Again, all six channels are heading over to that submix. Great. Um, another effective tool in doing uh, and preparing my final mix uh, is some compression. So I'm going to go to amplitude. I'm going to choose multiband compressor. And so if I open up this tool, and I've applied this to my sub mix too. So this is going to take all the music, sound effects, dialogue everything and uh, I'm gonna double click on that it's gonna open up this set of presets right here and as I begin to play that film I'll get the bill Sir? so we're taking a look at the dynamics of the scene and it's graphically showing me that And at the same time, it's showing me the output gain of that particular scene. So if I was having difficulties with something in the higher bands, the mid highs, the mid lows, the lows, um, I could start to work on adjusting those. Now, I found that um, some of the defaults here are helpful in preparing uh, my film for different venues. So depending on what the venue is, Broadcast obviously um, would 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 be up there if I'm looking to get my film, um, you know, shown on television. But even if it wasn't available on television, I'm still outputting the signal in, in the way that will be well received in a broadcast um, output. And so what happens in that sort of compression is it's taking this dynamic audio, the audio that was recorded. Um, was recorded with, with a great amount of dynamic range, much like a camera has uh, a, a wide dynamic range in the lightness to darkness. The sound recordings were also really, you know, very dynamic. 
And what compression does is it kind of puts a little bit of a limit on that so that this sound will hopefully sound better because it had all of it started with something high quality it'll actually sound good on many devices even if it's a low quality speaker it'll still sound good it'll sound good on high quality speakers and headphones so what the compressor does here is kind of make sure that everything is going to be packaged very nicely now i do have some output gain and you'll see that as i apply more of this uh compression or if i apply when i applied broadcast compression on this uh on this film it does boost the signal up and get pretty christina hot. nice to meet you So those sound effects get pretty loud there, so I'm actually going to pull down the overall gain just a little bit on this broadcast um, setting here, which is going to affect the film overall. So this is part of my mix process. So I want that sequence to be very loud. I'm, I'm carefully monitoring the signal level over on my meters as well as the small meters within the compressor window. So by applying this compressor and then reducing the gain slightly, I'm still pushing the peak right up to zero, but I'm not clipping. I'm not holding on to little red uh, bricks in the corner there. If I do get clipping like that, that's when the sound doesn't sound very good on your headphone speaker or um, stereo. So uh, we want to make sure and control that. There are some other presets here for different types of rooms and different types of things that you want it to sound like, uh, but I don't want my whole film to sound like walkie talkie. Another beer? Uh, yes, please that would not be ideal. But I'm gonna choose broadcast in this case and I've, I'm gonna leave that, I'm gonna bring that down a couple decibels. So these all export in real time. So whatever that uh, processing that needs to happen is happening on the fly. So I can listen to it right away. I don't need to render this out in any way. Um, I can also apply additional filters to that. Most likely the compressor would be the last thing that I would apply. But if I did have other um, a, a noise reduction on top of that, I probably wouldn't use a noise reduction on a noise reduction. It might start to really um, destroy those dialogue tracks. Um, any other filters or effects? Now you see the benefit of having all of these multiple tracks that if I did have a particular sound effect, I'm not sure that I would be able to find it at the moment here, but if I had a horn honk or something, um, like that. Let's see what this is. So a very uh, sort of mechanical sounding, um, well, it looks like it's a stereo pair. So 16 and 17 maybe should get um, a little bit of a analog delay. So if we apply that delay and let's choose crazy train and we're going to solo that so the trick about some of these delays though is once that clip ends uh, it looks like it's gonna it's gonna clip off that piece of delay So we need to have a little more length on this piece of sound effect for that to really work out But we did hear some of that Delay as it went through there if I want to get rid of this I just choose none and now it is gone uh, But the benefit of having my sound effects isolated onto their own piece of onto their own track so on this track there's only this sound effect and then is there yeah okay so 16 17 whatever this sound effect is over here on 16 it's another car sound so it would also apply uh perhaps if i had that delay but if i wanted to have one sound effect 
uh, applied on a track level, I would just give it its own track and move it down there. I can have as many tracks, well, within reason in Premiere. I'm up to 28, it looks like here. Um, so it's all playing this out. Save and save often. All right, um, so once I am saved, there we go. Uh, I'm gonna make sure and take Solo off. I'm gonna double check that all of my stuff is routing, everything's going to Submix 2, and then my, um, my Submix 2 is actually going to the mix. Now it is possible I could have put that amplitude and compression, um, that compression that I applied to Submix 2, I could have applied to the final mix. That would have been, a, it was unnecessary that I created the Submix channel 2, unless of course I wanted to have other effects uh, before it, or if I wanted to separate these into their own uh, stems, music, sound effects, dialogue, and each of them get their own uh, special treatment before they head over to the mix. So as you're watching your film one, one more time through, you're making sure that your levels are good over here and that your dialogue is hanging out at least minus 12, unless it's whispers or really quiet sounds. Um, but you want to have healthy signals overall. So really watching your meters. Uh, you know, I know some folks when they're in mix mode might make for a bigger, uh, a bigger window here so that I can see that more clearly as I'm watching the film. I'm really watching these levels here to make sure that they're going to play correctly. So when you go into the venue, whatever that is, if you're playing this on YouTube, um, it's going to play at the correct volume so you don't have somebody searching around trying to turn it up or somebody trying to turn it down um and that broadcast uh eq or compressor uh definitely does boost things up a little bit so you want to be careful with that uh after that i am basically done with my audio i'm gonna go back over here to editing and click on the timeline for just a moment here and the only other thing that I would like to share, uh, and this may also be covered in another video uh, somewhere, but if you're preparing your files for somebody else to mix, uh, I would have I would have done most of this work here uh, within there to get to the picture lock, and um, but after that. Um, hopefully the organization is there, maybe some volume stuff is there just for reference, but the sound mixer is going to go through and adjust things and, and um, add some more sound design to it, etc. The only thing after that that comes is the sound mixer, whoever that may be, is going to need the OMF files. So if I go down here to export and I choose OMF for Open Media Framework, so we've had this uh, initially, I believe it was an Avid Pro Tools uh, creation, but it's pretty much available in most nonlinear editing systems. So if you're in Final Cut or um, DaVinci or Avid, uh, you would have OMF as an export option. Um, and now OMF is a way of bundling up all of the sound files and the timeline and preparing it to be opened in that digital audio workstation. So if I'm working in Adobe Audition or Pro Tools, I can actually open up this OMF file and it prepares the project exactly the way that my Adobe Premiere project was prepared. So the time base and time code is all correct and all of the sound files are in the right place. Now I'm gonna select OMF here. It's gonna give me some options, obviously a name, whatever the type, uh, the name of the film is. The sample rate, most likely that's 48,000, unless I was working at something higher. Uh, 24 is ideal, but if for some reason you were working at 16 or um, everything is uh, at that. Um, I could either embed the audio or separate the audio. I don't think that matters to me very much, but you could check with your sound mixer. Um, and do I want to trim the audio files or do I want the complete audio files? Now, a lot of mixers probably aren't going to care uh, very much for having the entire sound file here available to them, but they will want some handles. And handles are the ability for them to pull out this clip by a couple of frames to make it a little bit longer so that perhaps they can do some sort of quick fade or 
um, other manipulation to it. So I have set 168 frames, whatever that amounts to in seconds. It might be five seconds, I believe. And I'm also going to include the panning information. So if I had done any special effects on uh, panning, I would include that as well. So once I do this, um, it's going to render out those clips, basically shorten them to uh, be exactly the right size and um, and bundle that up ready to send to the sound mixer. Now, it doesn't include any of the video information, so you're going to want to send them all a, a an export of the video clip uh, so that they'll have that for reference too, so they can see what you were thinking, who we're focused on, um, and all of that other stuff. So sometimes listening to the soundtrack, you don't know exactly what's going on, and you might help with some of those cues in the reference. Now, once you get that sound file back, um, you would most likely create another sequence and simply uh, you could leave all the picture clips in there or you could do a nested sequence. So here I have the, I just made a duplicate sequence of the final cut and I brought the sound mix in and dropped it into place. So this is the, the sound mix as the mixer created. Um, it comes in as a stereo track and played out equally. So all of the dialogue and uh, everything is mixed. Brother Beer? Uh, yes, please. I'm famished. So one of the things the uh, sound mixer did was to make the music sound a little more like it was in the bar rather than placed on top of the bar. Um, some of the other stuff I think is in there is a little more sound design of what that bar atmosphere sounds like. Uh, and so and that's all blended together and mixed at the appropriate level. So the dialogue is playing nice, the plate hits on the table are nice, uh, and any music cues that we might have are coming in. So now that I have the sound mix and the picture, I'm ready to export this as my final master. We'll take a look at that in another video.